Hello, and welcome to the second episode of Movers and Shakers. I'm Robert Mack. Today, our very special guest is Dan Ford, grandson and biographer of filmmaker John Ford. When I was eight years old, I watched John Ford's film Stagecoach in a rundown Motel 6 on a trip with my dad up to Northern California. The film's depiction of larger-than-life good guys and bad guys, its setting on the edges of what we called civilization, captured my imagination. And when I rewatched the film for my senior honors thesis on John Ford, I grew to appreciate the brilliant social themes as well, the microcosm of society that the little stagecoach represented, and how the outcasts rose to the challenges to become the heroes. John Ford is widely regarded as one of be uh, being one of America's most influential filmmakers. His westerns, such as The Searchers, Stagecoach, and My Darling Clementine, earned him the moniker, The Poet of the American West. For popularizing Monument Valley, he was also proud of being an honorary member of the Navajo tribe. Ford influenced generations of filmmakers, such as Martin Scorsese, Steven Spielberg, Peter Bogdanovich, and won four Oscars for Best Director, including for classics The Grapes of Wrath, and The Quiet Man. Although an Irish Catholic, Ford was proud of his distinguished military service as head of the photographic unit of the Office of Strategic Services during World War II. The stirring documentary, The Battle of Midway, won him an Oscar for Best Documentary. And for his willingness to put himself at great personal risk to record the war on film, he attained the rank of commander and rear admiral in the Naval Reserve. Dan Ford is a television veteran who authored Pappy, The Life of John Ford, the first notable biography on Ford to be based on his personal papers. Thanks to Dan Ford, those papers are now housed here on campus at the IU Lilly Library. From my personal experience researching in the collection, I can tell you that it's a treasure trove for those interested in Ford or Hollywood history in general. Mr. Ford and I spoke over Zoom, and despite some audio issues in the very, very beginning, we had a lively, enlightening discussion on John Ford, a fascinating and complex man, and a compelling filmmaker. Ford, thank you so much for joining me for this discussion. I really appreciate it. Can you hear me all right? Um, so first of all, maybe, you know, I will be, I'll be introducing your grandfather um, who he was and what he did. Um, maybe you, you, you can just give a brief introduction for yourself, um, for our audience. Okay, my name is Dan Ford. I'm John Ford's grandson. My father was Pat Ford, his, uh, his only son. Uh, John Ford had two children, my Aunt Barbara and my father, Pat. And Pat had three children, two boys and a girl. I'm the middle son. Um, I worked in the, I always wanted to be in the entertainment business, um, but I wound up on the television side, live and videotape TV production uh, and worked briefly in film, but I much preferred the videotape and live uh, presentation. I thought found film after working in live TV, very dull, very slow, you know, on a, on a, on a, single camera, uh, 60 minute show. <clears throat> if you shot eight pages a day, that was, you were doing great. But in a, if you were shooting a soap opera, you would shoot a hundred pages a day. And uh, of course it didn't any good, you know, it's yes, doctor, no doctor, she's pregnant. No, she's not, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just repetitive. And, uh, but anyway, it just moves a lot faster. And I just grew used to that. And I like the live events too, you know. You involved um, with the documentary. I can barely hear you. I'm sorry. All right, I'll get closer to the mic. You were involved in a documentary about your grandfather, The American West of John Ford, I think it was called. Would you repeat the question? I can barely hear you. I'm sorry. How did you um, get involved in uh, the documentary with about your grandfather, The <clears throat> American West of John Ford. Okay, well, Peter Bogdanovich had made that uh, directed by John Ford. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I I was just getting into the business and I saw that he'd done that for absolutely no money. You know, he did it for free. 
maybe that's why he was so grumpy in it, you know, and I thought, I said, you know, there's a show here that you can make some money on, you know, and so it was kind of a copy of that, except the focus was on the Westerns, but it was a commercial TV version, and it barely got on the air. Uh, it only got on the air because the producer who was doing Peggy Fleming uh, skating uh, specials was to do one in uh, Colorado, and, but that particular winter was very dry and warm and there was no snow and uh, she, they couldn't do it. So they did, uh, they did, they took our show. So lucky to get it on. Do you think um, director, directed by John Ford- I can barely hear you, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My microphone is a little bad sometimes. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, I'll try and stay in this space. Um, do you think Peter Bogdanovich's documentary uh, accurately captures John Ford's personality? Well, it, it I think uh, Ford was out there. He was grumpy. Uh, it captures the side of him. It doesn't capture all of him. Uh, it certainly does a good job of capturing his work, you know, the variety of his work, the nature of his work, particularly uh, the American theme films. But I think it, I think it amusingly uh, catches uh, the grumpy old man side of him. You know, uh, uh, he was more complex than that. Absolutely. And Peter well know, knew it, you know, but that worked for his film. So, you know. Do you think that the grumpy old man persona is something that John Ford tried to play off? In, in his in old age? Yeah, sure. Did he enjoy, did he enjoy playing that part? Do you think? Yeah. You know, Walter Matthau and Walter Lemon would have been his favorite actors or Burgess Meredith and the movie Grumpy Old Men, you know, Burgess is 90 and uh, Lemon and uh, uh, <laughs> Lemon is 70 and Burgess Meredith is calling damn kids, you know. <laughs> What um, in interviews, John Ford always comes off as kind of cantankerous and very often doesn't fully answer the question. Um, he did not like academic uh, questions, you know. To, uh, he, if you were a filmmaker, if you knew the process of film, like Lindsay Anderson or, or Peter Bogdanovich himself later on, you know, he could give quite. Uh, succinct and interesting answers, you know, of how he did something and how an actor responded and so on. But if you, most journalists, uh, most writers, most academics, I'm sorry, don't really know the process, you know, so. Very true. Um, it, but he, he respected fellow creatives. Do you think, um, what do you think John Ford would think of all of the academic research that has been that has surrounded his work over the last 40 years? Well, I think it would be surprised. Uh, I think uh, to him, it was, quote, a job of work. You know, it was something he did for a check. A lot of it, um, I asked him once about how did he feel about young Mr. Lincoln, which I think is a great film. And uh, Wonderful movie. And he said, yeah, it was a good commercial movie. You know, that was his response. That's what he thought of it. So it seems like he didn't consider himself to be an artist in the way that like um, uh, Truffaut or Bogdanovich would consider him to be like the poet of the American West. It doesn't seem like he thought of himself that way. Well, yes and no. I mean, if he did, he wouldn't admit it. You know, as part of that tough Yankee persona, you know, uh, Film directors of that era, yeah, guys like Howard Hawks and Hathaway, you know, they were tough guys, you know. Uh, they uh, they ruled the roost. And, uh, and you know, Ford uh, earned his spurs making outdoor westerns, uh, men's movies, you know, with primarily male casts. If he had a weak point, it was probably his handling of women, his love interests, his love stories. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, so he was a tough old school guy, you know, um, I mean, 
I don't know what else to tell you. Uh, he was not that different from a lot of his contemporaries, and he was a lot better man than a lot of them, like Cecil B. DeMille, mm. you know, and some others, you know. But he was, you know, I kind of think if, you, if you've seen the film Five Came Back or read the book about the war experiences of, uh, um, of uh, Capra, Ford, uh, Houston, uh, Willie Wyler, and uh, George Stevens, you know, he was, they're very much their contemporary and very much cut from the same cloth. One thing that um, a lot of people don't know about John Ford is, of course, the service that he did for the OSI and the service that he OSS, did. OSS, yeah. The OSS, excuse me. Um, the and OSS the and the Navy during the war. Um, do you think that, how do you think those experiences shaped him? Well, they made him... They shaped that whole generation, you know. I mean, they, they, uh, uh, it's, they shaped the whole country, you know. They, that experience shaped the whole generation. It made us much more international, you know. It made us realize that, you know, we're the big player on the block and uh, that America had international responsibilities. Uh, it made him, brought him in contact with um, uh, the horrors of war and in was, combat. And I was going to ask about um, the Battle of, of Midway, which he'd made a documentary about. Right. Much of that documentary was actually shot by Ford himself. He saw. Ford and one other cameraman, yeah. Was that Greg Toland? No, it was uh, a, a young uh, man named McKinsey uh, who was. Uh, I believe his name was Bob McKenzie, but it might be in the book. Uh, no, it wasn't. Greg Toland was in that unit, and Greg Toland was shooting December 7th. That was in process. And uh, there were political problems with the movie because uh, Toland was pointing fingers at the Army and the Navy for the disaster at Pearl Harbor. And he was getting in trouble. You know, he, was, he wasn't getting cooperation from the army and the navy uh, for obvious reasons you know and uh, and uh, so uh, Ford came down to Hawaii to uh, supervise that and you know to uh, smooth the waters for Toland and while he was down there he got wind of the uh, pending attack on uh, Midway and went up there and did that and then devoted his time and energies to getting Midway together and then came back and Toland was still in trouble. So <clears throat> he took it over from Toland and uh, Toland sent Toland to Brazil and uh, which was an ally, you know, and uh, he made some propaganda films for the US and the Brazilians down there. Uh, I guess Greg Toland, uh, the great, great cinematographer, great black and white cinematographer, shot Citizen Kane among other things. <laughs> Um, yeah. was a cinematographer, you know, he wasn't, a, yeah, well, he wasn't, you know, the politician necessary to be a producer and, uh, you know, to get along with the army and the Navy or Ford was clever enough to sneak around them or, or, sh or schmooze them. Uh, and December 7th was never released publicly. It was a scream for uh, a wartime uh, morale or a, <clears throat> energy booster, morale booster. They had a program where they would show it at defense factories and so on. But the Battle of Midway, curiously, went on to win an Oscar for Best Documentary. Yeah, so did December 7th. Really? Um, so do you think that, do you think that being in battle on a, on a personal level, seeing war up, up close influenced yes, Ford at all? absolutely. Because he saw it, he didn't just see it in Midway, you know, he was in, uh, whew, he was on the Doolittle raid. He was on a, one of the escort vessels. He saw Jimmy Doolittle take off. I didn't see any combat there, but then he went back and it was Midway. Then he was in North Africa where he saw combat and ground combat. And then he went to China, Burma, India with Donovan. And that was a more political thing. Donovan went there to get the OSS into China. 
and uh, but he did a he was there to schmooze the British and uh, and, and India and uh, you know establish good relations and because uh, everything that went to China had to go through India and they needed the the Indians and the Brits to help them I and. <clears throat> So he was in that theater and then he was a data, you know, I mean, he was, uh, he was, uh, George Stevens was the head army photographer and Ford was the head Navy photographer and all the naval footage you see was shot by Ford's unit and several of his men were in landing craft and uh, uh, were ashore. Uh, he went ashore at D-Day and about D-Day, D plus three or four or five and saw an awful lot of carnage. And I think it had affected him very deeply. Um, pivoting now. So he, he saw the war up close and personal. And, you know, at the time, he was, in 1940, he would have been 45 years old. In 1945, he would have been 50, you know, so he wasn't some 20 year old, the typical 25 year old, you know. He was seasoned. Um, really, really incredible. I mean, I, it's, it's a very different generation of filmmakers than today, right? those that had, you know, lived through the Great Depression, lived through World War II, and how those experiences shaped their vision of the world. It's a different country, you know. I mean, that, uh, hopefully we never have to do that again. <laughs> I hope so. Mm -hmm. um, just uh, pivoting a little bit back to Ford as a filmmaker, I've been surprised to learn that um, some of his favorite films are not the most famous of his movies. Um, the Sun Also Rises, I think, is one oh, of his. Oh, that's movies. BS, you know. I mean, that, you know, he, he, he will say things like, what's your favorite movie? You know, give you some movie you never heard of, you know, Aerosmith or The Sun Also Rises. The Sun Also Rises. The Sun Also and the sun also rises. You mean uh, the one he made for Herb Yates at uh, After the Quiet Man? Yeah, no, it was not the sun. Also, it was um, it was based on uh, who was it? Judge Priest, maybe? Yeah, it was a remake of one of those Judge Priest stories that uh, Fox owned those, and he made made one of those. Uh, we're talking That's about the uh, sun. Uh, what is that movie? Uh, um, the sun shines bright. That's sun it. shines bright. Okay, here's what it, I, you know. I think he did it to to piss off Herb Yates, who was the head of Republic, because Yates gave him such a hard time on a Quiet Man, and he had a three picture contract to make uh, the Quiet Man. He his first initial deal was John Wayne was under contract to. Uh, Republic Pictures. When, uh, if you recall, Republic Pictures was a well-established B-movie house. They were big on serials, big on cheap westerns, and they had a contract for John Wayne services. So John Wayne, being smart, he's figured, well, if I can get John Ford over here, maybe we can make some movie, good movies. So they go to, a, they go to Herb Yates, who is a man with no taste and no class, and um, they say, they, they, they pitch the quiet man to him. And Yates, uh, uh, Yates says, okay, you make me a John Wayne Western that makes money and I'll let you make the quiet man. So uh, they made uh, uh, one of the Calvary trilogy films, Rio Grande, which was a su successful film. So he had to green light the quiet man. And he fought him all the way on the quiet man. Hey, he didn't want to make it in Ireland. He never made a picture outside of California, much less, much less out of the country. He didn't want to make it in color. He thought it was a waste of money. And he fought him on every dime. And then when it was all over and quiet man was a big hit, won Oscars and uh, really helped put Republic on the map, then he stole all the money. You know, he uh, shortchanged Ford, Wayne and, and Ford's partner, Miriam Cooper, he shortchanged them. So Ford, to get his revenge, made The Sun Shines Bright as his third film. Now, this was kind of a, you know, a Judge Priest Southern story, small, lethargic, slow, a lot of black characters, which did not play well in, Repu in Republic's uh, Southern, uh, heavy Southern and Western uh, 
markets. So, you know, he did it because he wanted to do it and he knew he could, but he could do it. Mm -hmm. He, and he also said, he also told me, you always want to follow a big one with a little one. Never try to top yourself. You know, if you make a big film, a big success, follow it with a small one. And he liked to make small, personal, non-commercial films, you know. You think of... of Scorsese does that today. You know, he'll follow a big hit mob movie with an art house movie, you know. Scorsese loves John Ford. I know it, yeah. And he probably... Spielberg and uh, Eastwood, you know, they all study him. No, they they cite The Searchers and other movies as being huge influences. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with some of those directors that Ford was an auteur? On, on some of his films, an awful lot of his films were studio assembly line projects. You know, he couldn't have made all those films in 1939 that he made as an auteur. You know, I mean, uh, The Grapes of Wrath, he was involved in the script a little bit, um, but not a lot. Um, some of those movies have Daryl Zanuck's hand Especially yeah, exactly. my darling Clementine. You, know, you couldn't, you just, nobody could do that. I mean, uh, he was, okay, 1939, Stagecoach. That was a personal film. He he had wanted to make it for some time. And nobody had let him make a Western. Big hit. And Ford was very instrumental in putting it together. Followed by Young Mr. Lincoln, Studio Assembly Line. Drums Along the Mohawk, Studio Assembly Line. The Grapes of Wrath. Studio assembly line, long voyage home, small personal movie, um, not big box office, critically successful. Uh, Ford had big hand in it. Um, How green was my valley? Studio assembly line. Uh, uh, Willie Wyler was supposed to direct it and pre pre prepped it, but uh, he was under contract to, I believe, uh, Sam Goldwyn. And for, for whatever reason, it went over, uh, it fell behind and uh, Weiler had to get go back to Goldwyn or, but, uh, and Ford stepped in and shot it, you know, but it was pretty much prepared by uh, William, go uh, uh, William Weiler and credit should be shared with him. Uh, but, you know, it does, it shows Ford's touch, you know, and the Welsh and the, Familial, the breakup of familial relations. Similar. Yeah. 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 Which was felt deeply by, you know, I mean, people who have emigrated to this country, you know, I mean, by the Irish, by the Italians, by the Welsh, by everybody, you know. A lot of people today probably would miss the uh, importance of, of Ford's Irish heritage and his work. Um, the fact that you know he came from a family of of recent Irish immigrants. How do you think? Um, what are what are some of the main ways you think that influenced his work? Well, he always maintained a, a strong interest in Ireland. Uh, he w went over there during the uh, IRA revolution in 1920 and uh, visited some relatives and uh, got roughed up a little bit by the black and tans. And he was always very interested in Ireland. And, uh, and I know his father was, his father was probably sending money over there. You know, and a lot of those first generation immigrants were. And he had a lot of extended family there. So yeah, well, it, it, the same thing happens today. I mean, you know, if you got somebody from Mexico or somebody from better yet, Guatemala or Salvador that's here or Iran, I mean, they're following closely the, the difficulties their families are facing, you know, in, in their home countries, their original countries. Same thing continues today. I mean, look at Ukraine. I mean, you know, when all those Ukrainians get here, you know, we're gonna, yeah. Yeah. Very tragic. Um, Ford, um, Ford run, ran against some people during the, um, the blacklisting era. Um, could you maybe recount for the audience the famous story where Ford stood up to Cecil B. DeMille? Well, there was a Directors Guild meeting and uh, I know DeMille called out William Wyler, you know, which is 
I don't know if you call him a communist or whatever, exactly what he called him. And how do you call out a guy who's a colonel in the Air Force and, you know, gave up four years of his life to make uh, films for the Army Air Force and call him a traitor, you know, and, and while he was sitting on his ass at home, you know, with 50 bimbos on his lap, you know, uh, DeMille was a jerk. And Ford called him out. He said, uh, I don't know, forgot exactly what he what he said, but uh, um, CB, I like you. I don't. I, I respect you. Uh, you make good films. Uh, you make entertaining films for the American public. But I don't like you. I think you're mean and cruel. He did that at a director's meeting, director's guild meeting, board meeting, and uh, turned the tides on Demel and uh, got him cut down. And the meeting so, adjourned at, shortly after, I think. Yeah. He basically, yeah. And he said, I think, uh, let's vote a confidence, have a vote of confidence for, I forgot um, who the, uh, who the uh, chairman was or the head of the guild was, uh, but uh, I'll think of it in a minute, but um, let's have a vote of confidence and let's go home, you know, and they did. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ford, how do you call somebody who gave up four years of their life, you know, uh, you know, was flying, uh, made Memphis Bell and flew all those missions over Germany, got shot at, you know, I mean, give me a break. I'd call that man a patriot, but yeah. <laughs> not to Mr. DeMille. Um, it, I think it's also interesting. Is, isn't that the meeting where he stood up and said, my name is John Ford. I I'm make Western. Western. Yeah. That's, and that's, that's how he thought of himself, you know, Right, right. Somebody who made the odors, the the cowboy movies. You, you know, despite all the other wonderful, you know, work that he did, uh, the Informer, uh, How Green Was My Valley. He he worked across genres, but somehow the Western was closest. All right, filmmakers in those days weren't as pretentious as they are today. Um, they were making, they were more like television people are today. They consider that they were making mass entertainment. I asked Philip Dunn, who wrote uh, How Green Was My Valley and a lot of other good films, and uh, later became a director, a very elegant, very well-educated man. And I asked him, I said, you know, at the, in, in the height of 20th Century Fox, when you were making all those great movies, did you ever realize what you're doing? And, and he said, no, it was just the movies. It was just the movies. You know, it's like, meh, we're making Dragnet. You know, we're making, uh, you know, I Love Lucy, you know. I mean, we're making just entertainment. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, now today we look on it as, you know, as great art. But to them, when they were making it, it was, you know, it, the the highbrow stuff was the theater, you know, and the film was a new art. Well, it was a new medium too. Right, relatively, yeah. Relatively, start, particularly when it started, it was when the silent era was really the main immigrant. The main audience was non English speaking immigrant. You know, that's why they, they played so well. You know, it was more accessible to working yeah. class immigrant families. Yeah, and you can get in for a nickel or a dime, you know, so. In the theater, yeah. Um, so pivoting now to your book a little bit, why did you decide to write Pappy? Uh, I don't know, you know. <laughs> in, in retrospect, I should have turned over. I, I had assembled the material when my grandfather moved down to Palm Desert and closed his office, there was tons of material, uh, paperwork, and it was just going to, I don't know what was going to happen to it. So I started organizing it and going through it. And I started interviewing people that, that um, came to visit my grandfather and that had closely worked with and associated with my, were associated with my grandfather, like Hank Fonda and, and uh, Jimmy Stewart and who were fairly regular visitors and and uh, people came out from the East Coast, uh, General Al Wittemeyer, and uh, they shared stories with me. And, um, you know, it was started as a collection of uh, academic data, you know, uh, materials. And then I just started writing it, you know, putting it together and it became an obsession. And I, that was a mistake on my part. 
because I'm not a professional, excuse me, I'm not a professional writer. I should have turned it over to a, uh, a guy like Scott Iman or Joe McBride and let them do the writing, you know, I, or I would write it with them, you know, but uh, we would have had a better book. But, you know, I be it became, it gradually became a mission. It became an obsession. Well, you, you paved the way for Joseph, Joseph McBride and Scott Iman's biography. Well, at least I, you know, saved the material. If I didn't, nobody else in my family was really interested in it. You know, and I, I realized that this was important stuff. So, Is there anything, looking back on the book, is there anything that you would change that you would write about differently? Well, you know, I haven't looked at it for a long time. Um, the book that was published was about, two thirds of what was written. In other words, the publisher, Prentice Hall, had a cookie cutter formula of this kind of book. And it was gonna be X number of pages, you know, and I even had to pay to put my own index in there. They wouldn't, they wouldn't do the index. And uh, at the end of the editing process, and the editor was a good man. He did a lot of right things. He cut out a lot of good stuff. He cut out a lot of stuff that should have been cut out, but he cut out a lot of stuff that shouldn't have been. And, you know, my relationship with Prentice Hall was pretty sour at the point, that point. So, you know, I was glad to just walk away from it and be done with it. Um, for film students just starting to read about Ford, where would you suggest that they go? Peter Bogdanovich's book. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, good anecdote. Um, yeah, it would definitely short read, uh, funny, charming, um, good, good start. And then maybe graduate to my book and then Iman and, uh, McBride or skip mine and go to Iman and McBride. I, I read yours first. Um, then I, I went to Bogdanovich and then I went to McBride. We lost Peter this year, so, you know. I'm I wrote it the day that, that he passed, I wrote a eulogy on my blog. Good. He he was such an influence. I like truly his I mean, first of all, I love I love Last Picture Show and I love um What's Up Doc. Um, but I have so much I have so much respect for how he got started as a journalist and as a writer. And you know, a lot of people try to follow that pattern. You know, he was kind of the American Truffaut, you know, he was a, a critic and a, a writer. And he wrote books like not only Ford, but he wrote one on Howard Hawks and he wrote one on uh, on Hitchcock. And <clears throat> he studied their films. And, you know, in studying their films, he learned about film. And his father had been an, an artist, you know, so he came from a, a kind of a bohemian artistic background. And um, <clears throat> um, anyway, uh, yeah, he learned a lot. Uh, Unfortunately, there is a few lessons he didn't learn, uh, but that's another story. Uh, but he was a good guy and a good friend of everyone in my family. You know, when my aunt was uh, went back to work after my grandmother died, my aunt went down to Palm Desert with us and took care of my grandmother in her last years. And she, be, you know, she bored and alone down there and along with my grandmother and not liking Palm Desert, and missing Hollywood. She, you know, fell into her alcoholism pretty bad. And as uh, <clears throat> soon as my grandmother died, she and <clears throat> my father uh, traded places and my father bought her out of that house. And she moved back to LA and Peter put her to work, you know, and she was fine. You know, she sobered up and went back to work as a film editor. It was a very gracious gesture. Yeah. So, you know, she needed to be working and she needed to be love movies. You know, she could sit, she would sit and watch movies and watch cuts and, oh, they shouldn't have done this and da, 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 da. And, you know, was just uh, totally absorbed by film. Um, as we start to wrap up, I'd just like to know, is, do you have a favorite memory of your grandfather that you'd like to share? Well, when I was in Vietnam, he came to see me, you know, he, uh, uh, he, uh, <clears throat> I got orders to come see uh, somebody important in uh, 
the Caravelle Hotel in, in uh, Saigon. And I was out in the field and I, what, 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 you know, and boom. And then he told me that, yeah, your grandfather is an admiral. He's here, he's go down and see him. So, you know, I went down there and spent an evening with him, had dinner with him. And, you know, uh, the next morning I had to go back, you know, but uh, I mean, that was pretty amazing that he would pull those strings and, and do that, you know. Um, but I had a lot of good memories of him as a kid because he was, you know, I use him as a model as because I'm a grandfather and I use my grandparents as models because, you know, my parents, they they um, they were always working, you know, like most parents are. They're they're busy, you know, and uh, they were good. I mean, we didn't lack for the basics, you know, but everything special, <clears throat> everything extra came from the grandparents. And that's kind of where I try to do with my grand my grandchildren, you know, uh, I mean. My daughters do well with their kids. You know, they have everything they need, but it's the extra things, like a trip to Hawaii or something like that, that, you know, that I try to provide. What, um, what do you think is your grandfather's legacy? You know, it's hard to say with the, with the wokeness and the political correctness in Hollywood, uh, the way things are, you know, there's people say he's a male chauvinist, he was this, he was that. You know, I don't know how it'll stand up. Uh, you know, in the, in the 60s and early 70s, he was very out of favor. And then came, along come Peter and uh, Marty Scorsese and they resurrect his reputation. And now he may be a male chauvinist pig, a homophobe, but this or that. I don't know, you know. Uh, I think it's kind of unfair. I think you got to judge people by their times, you know. Um, I he think was, yeah, he wasn't a perfect man by any means. Absolutely. You know, what can I he say? Was, I, I, I will say I was very disappointed. I went to the new Academy Museum. And they did have a, a small exhibit on Stagecoach. But I thought that it was... Very. Well, I don't have any material on stagecoach. You guys have it all. You know, I mean, I haven't given them anything. Really? Uh, because it was a very the, unfavorable depiction. Let's just say that. Yeah, I, you know, and I don't care because, you know, <laughs> that Academy Museum isn't going to work. It's in a bad location. There's no parking, you know, it's, it's uh, whatever, you know. I don't know. I don't care really. I mean, Ford wasn't terribly in He was very involved in the Directors Guild, but not so much in the Academy. So, um, do you think? Do you think that um, maybe well, they resent the fact that they don't have anything? Maybe they resent the fact that I didn't give them anything. That I gave it all. Why, if I may ask, why IU of all places? Well, the the, the first thing. So there are several reasons. Uh, it was a deal, a, a friend of mine, a rare book dealer who does this sort of thing. We wanted to place the papers. I wanted to place the papers <clears throat> in one place that was responsible and it could handle them. And if we could get some money, that would be great. And IU came forward, offered us a small amount of money, but it was a very respectable, well-endowed, large Lilly Library. It was in the middle of the country, accessible from Chicago, equally accessible to New York and LA. It wasn't USC, it wasn't UCLA, it wasn't the Academy, and it wasn't NYU. So, you know, why not? And uh, they had uh, Orson Welles' material. So that was a pretty good start, you know? So. IU, IU has been good to us. You know, I, I, I like IU. We've been treated it's, well by you guys. I think it's a, it's a good place for the Ford Papers in the middle of the country. Yeah, you know, it's accessible to everybody. And, you know, we try to make it, we try to grease the skids for anybody who's, uh, who's uh, you know, who's a serious academic or writer. And if they're a film producer, well, give us a few bucks and you can have this and that, you know? So if they're a commercial outfit, so... Mm -hmm. Um, do you think that wokeness is a barrier to um, students rediscovering for its work? You know, I don't really care about college students anymore. I mean, I, I'm so old that, you know, I think, of, and I'm, you know, I'm a guy who went to Berkeley, you know. <laughs> uh, My mom went to Berkeley. 
Yeah. Uh, I, I just think it's a badge of ignorance, to tell you the truth. I mean, it's, uh, first of all, I mean, if, if you really hate gay people, you're a fool. If you really hate black people, you're an idiot. I mean, you know, I mean, aren't we past all this stuff already? I mean, you know, male chauvinism. I mean, it, isn't that also old history? It's yesterday's fight, you know? Why, there are new things to worry about, you know, like Putin. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, the, the actual war in Ukraine, yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, there, there are real problems out there, you know, and, you know, I think global warming is an issue, but I think the state of California can't solve it by itself as it seems to be trying to do, you know, I think the problem originates in the industrialization of Asia, but, you know, what do I know, you know, yeah, all those bit. coal power plants in China. That might have something to do with it. Um, uh, lastly, um, what are your personal favorite Ford films. Well, same as everybody else. The Quiet Man, they were expendable as a personal favorite. Uh, the Searchers, uh, the Calvary Trilogy, uh, you know, The Grapes of Wrath, How Green Was My Valley. You know, the, the big ones. Yeah. One, one more question um, just for myself. It, when I read um, McBride's book and he was discussing uh, My Go Darling Clementine. One of seemed, my parents too, yeah. Oh, I love, one of my Probably my very, favorite. very, very, you know, very poetic, poetic, and that had Ford pacing, you know. Yeah, yeah, classic Ford pacing. Um, but it 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 seemed like you guys disagreed a little bit on Ford's handling of humor. Um, he thought that there was kind of a Shakespearean quality to it, um, whereas you thought that Zanuck was right to sort of, um, you know take it down a notch in my darling. Well, opinion. you know, Ford would do a little a little too much slapstick sometimes, I think. You know, sometimes it was effective, like in The Quiet Man, there was some great, great, mostly verbal humor, you know. There was some, you know, the wonderful wit. Um, and some good good stuff in, uh, <clears throat> in uh, the film you just mentioned with Fonda and Jane Darwell and, you know, I mean, but <clears throat> Ford was humor, comedy was not Ford's forte, let's face it. I mean, it's uh, Steven Spielberg after 1941 said, I'm never going to make another comedy again. It's just not my thing. And uh, Ford's best comedy, it, it wasn't really a comedy, but it, it had ele strong comedic elements was The Quiet Man. But it wasn't a strong suit. Action, family, um, Americana, you know. And with, with The Quiet Man, his it was such a personal film to him too that, you know, maybe it maybe it wouldn't have worked, it wouldn't have worked otherwise, but um Well he shopped it, he uh, it was published in the twenties in the Saturday Evening Post, and he bought the short story by a very obscure Irish short story writer named Maurice Welch. And, uh, you know, it was, it was very, it was so brief. It was like three pages. It was almost like a mood piece. You know, it's there in the library. There's a copy of it. And, uh, you know, you, you look at it and you say, where's the movie? You know, what's going on? It's a fighter. You're going home to Ireland. You know, I, I don't think there's a girl in the short story. There's no woman. I don't know if there's uh, <clears throat> the girl's brother. You know, I don't know if there's all those struggles. It's just, I'm going home, you know. I've had enough, and uh, it's it, in a way it's every immigrant's dream, you know. I mean, what immigrant doesn't in America doesn't dream of going back to to Sicily and sitting out of the ocean, or going back to the mountains of Guatemala and his village, and you know, being with his family, you know. The movie does have a dreamlike quality. The beautiful Technicolor cinematography, yeah. the glass, green rolling fields. This this village that seems like out of another time. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, Mr. Ford, um, before we wrap this up, is there anything else you'd like to say? No, thank you. I hope I could be of some small help to you. And uh, Mr. Ford, be in uh, touch and let me know if you have any questions. I, I absolutely will. Um, I do want to say that this has been a great honor for me. It oh, really has been. I, I, <laughs> 
you're easily honored. Anyway, thank you and uh, good luck with your projects huh? and best to your students. Thank you, Mr. Ford. Um, and all the best to you as well. My obsessive fanboying of Dan Ford aside, I hope that you enjoyed our discussion. And we'll be back with another episode very soon and more stimulating conversation. <laughs>